Good evening, guten Abend, a very warm welcome to all of you from Kansas City. My name is Rima Girnus. I am the managing director of the Goethe Pop-Up Kansas City, a branch of Germany's Federal Cultural Institute, the Goethe Institute. It is my pleasure to be here today to welcome historian Timothy Snyder and illustrator Nora Krug for a conversation about their new graphic edition of On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. A very warm welcome to you, Nora and Tim. Thanks so much for being with us today. This event is presented in partnership with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, Union Station, Kansas City, and University of Missouri, Kansas City, which is represented here through our moderator, Professor Andrew Bergerson, UMKC Professor of History and Public Humanities. Before we continue with the introductions, please allow me to provide a brief overview of today's program and remind you quickly of some housekeeping rules. This event will be 60 minutes long and will be recorded. The program consists of two parts. We'll begin with a conversation between our moderator and two guests, which will last about 30 minutes. This will be followed by some time for questions from the audience. For these, please use the Q&A box you'll find on the bottom or on the top of the screen. It really depends on your uh, um, computer. Feel free to post at any time during the event. The chat will be disabled. It is always great to know where you are joining from, so please introduce yourself with your name and your city. And now, I'd like to welcome Professor Andrew Bergerson, today's moderator, who will introduce our two guests. Professor Bergerson is a historian of modern Germany with particular interest in the history of everyday life, ethnographic oral history, interdisciplinary German studies, and the public humanities. He is a professor of history and public humanities at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where he has taught a variety of courses on modern German, modern European, and modern global history. He earned his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1998, has taught in France, Germany, and Taiwan, and has awarded the UMKC's Trustees Faculty Scholar Award for research in 2005. He has authored or co-authored various monographs, including Ordinary Germans in Extraordinary Times, 2004, The Happy Burden of History from 2011, and Ruptures in the Everyday from 2017. Welcome, Professor Bergerson. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm very excited to have this conversation with our two uh, very, very special guests today. Uh, let me introduce them for you. <clears throat> Tim Snyder is the Levin Professor of History at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna. His 15 books have appeared in more than 40 languages. They have been honored with the Hannah Arendt Award for Political Thought, the Leipzig Book Prize for U European Understanding, the Literature Award of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Award of the Dutch Auschwitz Committee, and the Warsaw Getting Ghetto Uprising Medal. Among, among other distinctions. His work has inspired paintings, posters, sculptures, plays, films, punk rock, rap, and opera. The lessons of this book are quoted around the world in demonstrations in defense of freedom. He also lives in New Haven, Connecticut. Our second guest is Nora Krug. She is the author of Belonging, A German Reckons with History and Home, which was the winner of the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award and named the best book of 2018 by the New York Times. Her work has garnered medals from the Society of Illustrators and the New York Art Directors Club and was chosen by Houghton Mifflin's Best American Cities uh, series and the Sundance Film Festival. Krug received the Fulbright and Guggenheim Fellowships and was named Illustrator of the Year in 2019 by the Victoria and Albert Museum. She is an associate professor of illustration at the Parsons School of Design in New York City. Welcome to both of you, Tim and Nora. Thank you. So uh, we'll begin with our conversation. Um, as, as our audience may or may not know, Tim, you wrote On Tyranny in 2017. It was published in 2017. And now the new edition, the graphic edition of it has been just published. It's come out literally last month. Um, uh, with, uh, in collaboration with Nora. So we're here to talk about both of these different works. Um, let's start with the 2017 book. Tim, wh why did you write this book and what do you think that this book tries to do? 
Well, I think all of us as historians carry around different kinds of knowledge, and uh, much of what we do is devoted to, you know, articulating that knowledge in forms that our colleagues will appreciate and understand, and will will build up into some kind of, you know, general scholarly understanding of what's happening. But I think we also have public knowledge. Um, we have the ability, like people in other professions, to communicate what we know in, in a slightly different language, um, not necessarily a simpler language, but a language which is closer to the everyday. And I, I guess at, at that moment in 2016, I felt the time had come for me to try to take the things that I thought I understood about the 20th century and turn them into you know, norms, turn them into guides for action. So. On Tyranny as it was written was a very brief book. It's a pamphlet. I mean, I, I it's it's funny to call it a book because you know my other books are you know they're whatever they're 400 pages long and they have a thousand footnotes or whatever they might be. And they're the product of years of concentration and review and discussion with colleagues. And this was really a kind of outburst. I mean, it was it was it, it could only exist because of what I already knew, but it it, it, it arose because I had made a certain decision. The decision was, I'm going to engage um, because I think this is a time. Uh, with the with the collapse of democracy around the world in general, and the the election of Mr. Trump in the United States in particular, where we should all bring into the public what we've got, and so that's that's how on tyranny arose. Um, I'm really happy to talk about that because you know I, I take for granted that a lot of you here haven't haven't read the book. Um, I, I want to sort of start off the, the this conversation though by saying that the on tyranny that exists now, the graphic version, um, is, is is in my view, and I can say this because I'm not the illustrator, a much richer and better and more interesting book. Um, and I look forward to talking to, to Nora and to Drew about that. Yeah. Um, before we then get into the details of the book, maybe Nora, what attracted you to this text? And why did you decide you wanted to work on this project? Well, it's a, it's a wonderful text. It's a, an inspiring text. It's also a very humane text because it's a call for action and uh, a call to make us better human beings in a way by engaging with our world. Um, and uh, I, I was drawn to the text because it focuses on the idea that we should learn from history. Um, and that's something that all of my previous work has been focusing on as well. So it um, has seemed like a continuation of the things that I had been thinking about for many years, but of course coming at it from a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so when Timothy asked me whether I wanted to illustrate it, I was immediately taken with the idea. And I just want to state up front, you know, as a as a, a a member of an older generation teaching a younger generation all the time, I'm astonished by the fact about how visual our students are. But young people today are so their world is on many people and today their world is on social media and they think visually. So having a text like this, not only in a in a uh, traditional format, but in this graphic form, really opens it up to entirely new audiences that had not that may not ordinarily engage with a text like that. Um, if we could get the uh, the the PowerPoint set up for us, um, Tim, there are this book has twenty. I struggle to find the words warnings or um, uh, recommendations or. Um, uh, advice for what to do. How do you know when you're in a tyranny? When? What do you do about it when you when you see it coming? Um, as you said, you know, 2016 was a crucial year in American history. Um, which ones are the? If you could go to the table of contents, please. Um, which ones are the ones that are the most important to you? Which are the ones that were really to, closest to your heart? So let me, let me start with a, just the offhand remark you made in the middle about how about the question, how do you know? Right. How do you know that you're facing a problem? Like, when do you know it's time to do something? I think it's very important to, to start from the assumption that if you really want a democracy, you have to be doing at least something all the time. You know, that the, the, that the, the ancient Greeks were right. And the founding fathers, for that matter, were also right, and Frederick Douglass was right, and a whole lot of other people have been right, that democracy is something that is a constant struggle, even in the best of times. And so if you wait until you're sure that it's a crisis, then you have already lost. And so the character, the character of these lessons is such that 
you don't have to agree with my analysis of where we are right now in 2021 or where we were when I wrote this in 2016. You don't have to accept the analysis. I mean, I have an analysis, but you don't have to accept it because all 20 of these things make sense even if you believe democracy is flourishing. Right. So it, even if you think that we're not on the, the edge, um, nevertheless, these are all these are all really good ideas. So, I mean, my, my answer to your question is really straightforward. It, it has to be lesson number one. Um, lesson number one, don't obey in advance, is, is something which, um, like a lot of these lessons in my own you know, intellectual biography, comes from experience with German debates. Um, don't obey in advance, or what I call avoiding anticipatory obedience, comes from a German term, which is for us island gehorsam, um, which means something like bounding ahead in order to obey. And uh, so the notion here is that we tend to accommodate, we are accommodating creatures, and that's very often a good thing. It's appropriate, right? Like, you know, watch, both Nora and I are accommodating ourselves to the rules of, of this exchange, and we will presumably continue to do so for an entire hour. That's normally a good thing. Um, but there's a moment when you have to have another idea of what's normal, and your idea of the, of the other idea of what's normal is not what everyone else is doing, which we subconsciously adapt to, but what we think is right. And so there must be times in one's personal or political life where there's a clash between adapting and one's sense of what's right. And the point of don't obey in advance is that we have to accept that there are such moments and we have to be a little bit courageous. But this, and, and lesson one is, is, is also lesson one because if, if, not, if you can't follow lesson one, then the other 19 lessons are useless. If you're, if you're just going to obey in advance, if you're just going to normalize everything, as an awful lot of Americans do, then the other lessons aren't really going to speak to you because your, your habit of normalization is going to make them all seem irrelevant. The other, the other meaning that I like of this concept of anticipatory obedience from the literature is this notion from the 1930s and the 1940s that ordinary Germans would anticipate what the, the Fuhrer needed and would jump ahead and, and implement it even in advance of what the government is doing. And that creates this dynamic between state and society that's quite dangerous. And but I it also, yeah, but it also means, sorry to interrupt you, but it also means that we are always already responsible. So we can't just say that, uh, that, that the democracy you know, crashes because someone shows up wearing tall leather boots and tells other people what to do. We know from history, just to recast what you just said, we know from history that it always involves us. It always involves a lot of people, not just obeying, but anticipating and moving forward and making things possible that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And if that's true historically, it means that in every moment, we always bear responsibility for what's happening. We can't just say, oh no, that's about a bad leader or that's about, that's about those perpetrators over there. It means that we all at every moment bear a certain amount of responsibility for not obeying in advance. So there are so many things we could talk about. You talk about one party states, voting, civil disobedience, language. Um, there are tons of ways we could get into the topic further. I, I actually wanna start on a, a one that's really important to me as a professor, um, professional ethics. I know that's strange. If you could bring the, the next slide up, um, it's maybe a way, a weird way to begin the conversation or to enter into it. But uh, nurses, lawyers, elected officials, teachers, doctors, police officers, uh, professors, uh, workers in factories, what does it mean for them? Why is professional ethics so important as a way to resist tyranny? Well, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna say something about that, then I'm gonna pass it on to Nora because it, in part, um, this book itself is a sort of exercise of professional ethics. So, I mean, I, as a historian, have done something slightly unusual, and Nora has also, as an artist, done something which is slightly unusual. And so, I, I want to hear how how I want to hear how Nora thinks about the professional responsibility of artists then and now. But the general answer to your question is that our professions or our vocations are a commitment which is not entirely individual and which doesn't have to do with the government. 
with the state. So our professions are a kind of middle realm in life, a source of practices and a source of ethics. They're, they're a part of our life, which we can consider ethically and, and, and we, can, we can see our colleagues as, as examples. We can see our colleagues as a, as a source of ethics. And the ethics are particular to the profession. This is very important as well. So you know, if you're a worker, at what point do you strike? If you're a bureaucrat, at what point do you not pass on a given order? If you're a lawyer, which lawsuit will you not take up? If you're a, a, a if you're if you're a physician um, or a veterinarian, what kind of experiment will you not undertake? Those questions are specific to the professions, and the answer always has to be, in some sense, professional. So, in a way, this is like I mean, it's a natural segue actually from number one because it reposes the question not at the level of the individual looking out at the whole political or social situation, but at the level of someone belonging to a profession. How should I behave? You know, Quay, how should I behave as a historian? How should I behave as an artist? How should I behave as, as a doctor? And also, when we see ourselves as belonging to professions, those professions or those vocations can serve as barriers or at least as, as breaks which slow this process down, as, as we've actually seen in the United States in the last five years. I mean, the way that many teachers behaved, the way that some trade unions behaved, the way that some lawyers behaved, and actually the way that some CEOs behaved at the end of the day, had a great deal of influence on how things turned out in, in the last presidential election. But I mean, I think I think artists and writers are a very specific example of this. And so I want to I want to turn the artist part of this question over to Nora. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, illustration has always played a major part in the way we think politically, socially, um, religiously. Uh, you mentioned earlier that images uh, or illustrated books uh, can affect younger generations, but I also think we often underestimate what a big role images play for our adult understanding of those subjects. I mean, we see this very clearly with film. We don't think of illustration necessarily as uh, achieving that, or, or we, it's just not in the forefront of our minds. But for centuries, illustration was the medium that communicated these kinds of ideas that uh, cemented social hierarchies and political ideas and religious systems, uh, showed us how we should adhere to the principles of the societies we lived in and showed us also what would happen if we didn't. You know, the depictions of hell, for instance, is, is one example. Just seeing these images made people feel like, you know, I better behave and do what the church wants of me. Um, and then in medieval times, there's so many examples for, for instance, uh, anti-Semitic prints uh, depicting, you know, Jewish men in obscene contact with pigs. That was a recurring motif throughout Central Europe um, that also the Nazis drew from, you know, they, with the expression Jewish pig, for, for example, they drew directly from this wealth of imagery that had existed throughout times um, and then developed their own idea of degenerate art. Um, so this is all, you know, talking about the negative examples, but of course, uh, artists also have a responsibility and, um, you know, can, can inform the way we think posit positively, not, not only impact the way we think, but also help us question uh, our um, stereotypical ideas of the worldviews we have or that are constantly um, communicated to us. They can question them, they can provide alternative ideas for how our society should work. Um, so I really think that illustrators have a responsibility. Um, and I think every illustration that's created is always created in, in a context, in a political context, whether the artist is aware of it or not. What they do when they create images always say, says something about uh, the society they live in. Um, and also uh, at the same time, concurrently, it says something about who they think they are not. I mean, it's always in relation to something else. Um, and I think it's very important for illustrators to be aware of that, uh, that, that this also subjective power of illustration because uh, illustration doesn't claim to be objective. And so um, it's prone to manipulating the way we think, and we have to be very careful about how we communicate, what we can communicate. Um, and uh, I mean, as, as Timothy said earlier, um, this applies to any, any profession, obviously. And what I think is so wonderful about this particular chapter is that it underlines the fact that we have to be humans first. You know, we are humans first, and then our moral ability to judge 
you know, a particular situation we're in um, will hopefully affect the professional decisions that we make. Um, I, I'm going to ask the um, Kendra to please um, move us over to chapter 11, um, investigate. Um, your, your comments made me think of this chapter and the, um, the importance of asking questions in an era of social media, of quote unquote fake news, which of course for historians is nothing new. <laughs> we, uh, we, we've been talking about uh, the role of media in misrepresenting facts for a long time. Um, uh, we now have reports recently of uh, Americans eating dirt um, in order to save themselves from COVID, believing that um, this is going to be a cure. Um, what does investigate mean in, in an era when social media is, um, is the dominant mode through which people get their information? Well, so as, as, as Nora said, things exist in a context, and although each of these lessons can be read independently. Um, there is a kind of logical progression in them where I, if we, I start from lesson one and move from lesson 20 and lesson one is the precondition to all the others and lesson 20 is where we are when things are at their worst. Um, and 11 investigate only really makes sense after 10. So if you don't mind me just saying what 10 was. So 10 is believe in truth. And that's, you know, th that along with like make eye contact is one of the ones that seem to people to be so simple that they're all like, there's a kind of astonishment that someone could say something so naive, which is, I think to me, like a sign, like a totem of, 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 of the self-destructive jadedness of our, of our worldview that, you know, we, we, we take for granted that everyone is messing around with the truth and there maybe there really isn't any truth. And that assumption I mean, it's contradictory, of course, because if you believe there's no truth, that's all. That's also a truth claim. But whatever, um, right. that's not bother people. Um, but 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 the 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 way that we've all become jaded, it kind of feels like wisdom. Um, but it's not wisdom. It's like it's kind of it's sort of like a cheap teenager self protective trick. I mean, it's hard to get to the truth, and you can be deceived along the way, um, and people will think you're naive for caring. But if you don't care about the truth then you really are giving up on democracy because a lot of things that we associate with democracy require truth. Like you can't have, you know, we can't have courts without findings of fact. You can't have civil society without um, its members agreeing on some basic facts of the things they're interested in, whatever those happen to be. Uh, and the the weak can't defend themselves against the strong without without the truth, right? The strong will always have better spectacle. And in that situation, the truth is the truth is a final defense. So I lay all that out because it's the ethical, you know, penumbra. It's the ethical background to to number eleven. Investigate where the point I'm trying to make is that you do have to figure some things out for yourself, um, and that doesn't mean distrusting everyone else. It doesn't mean distrusting everything else and relying on your first impulses. On the contrary, investigate means working until you're a little bit surprised. You know, working till you find this stuff which maybe doesn't harmonize with what you already thought or what, what the people around you think, right? And investigate means ending up in a place where you didn't expect to be in in the beginning. And it it particular, I mean, what the, what I try to emphasize here is that this is actually like a lot of things that have to do with freedom. It's actually social work, like it's actually a communal effort. I cannot find out for myself like basic things about that are essential to my life or my family's life. I cannot find out by myself whether the water is polluted, whether the school board's corrupt, where local politicians come from. I just can't, you know, I need local journalists to do that. And so part of investigating is realizing that if we all, if all 300 million of us tried to do it individually, we'll fail. We have to have an ethic and a profession of investigative journalism. We have to see that as a good thing. We can't go along with the people who call journalists, you know, enemies of the people, which you know, as you and I both know, has is is, is a phrase which was familiar in the 1930s in Nazi Germany, and not only, also in the Soviet Union. Um, we and, have to see and, that. And also, and also, doctors and also professors. You have to rely on people who are experts who know. That doesn't mean you don't doubt, you don't question, right. you don't challenge. But without those resources, then it society really can't function yeah but you have to that's right i mean you have to rely on the people like the doctors and the professors are people who are also doubters like you have to rely on the people who are following some kind of method you know and you follow the method yourself but but thanks i just wanted to, the, the point i just wanted to land on was that as you just said investigate is also a commitment 
right? If you don't have resources behind investigation, then we all end up living in the news desert, as many of us do already. And then we're just kind of floundering and then we're vulnerable to spectacle. And then we may very often feel that we're right or have strong feelings, but those strong feelings will be coming from someone who, you know, who, who understands us better than we understand them, you know, and then, and then we're in trouble. Absolutely. Great. Um, I, I, I want to be able to get to all the questions from our audience. So I'd like to switch uh, now for, I, 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 there's, there's, we could go on for a really long time. I'd like to switch to some of the motifs through which Nora has tried to illustrate some of these images. Um, uh, Kendra, if you could move to um, page 88, 89 and 104, 105. So uh, I, you know, here's a, a page that I, you know, I could have picked out so many. In fact, I have a friend who emailed me before this uh, presentation and she said that she already owns the book and she sits with her kids and she looks through it together because they find the illustrations so captivating. So, um, uh, Here's an example of you like doing such different things to illustrate this. You have historical photos, you have, I guess, re remakings of digital photos, as well as your own illustrations. Would you talk a little bit about your creative process and how, what, how did you decide what to put where in, 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 on a page like this? Yes, um, I just read a German review of the book that said that, um, Timothy Snyder writes about liberty and Nora Krug took the liberty to do whatever she wanted with the text. <laughs> <laughs> Which made me laugh because it really, it really uh, uh, felt like that, uh, the whole process, uh, thanks to Timothy and his generosity and be, uh, you know belief basically in uh, in my approach um, and it was a, a you know I started the process during lockdown so I was I was at home in my studio I didn't really talk to many people uh, outside of my immediate family and so I really was stuck in this room just focusing on this book and I didn't ask many people's advice about what I was doing and I basically started uh, from, you know, from scratch and from the beginning of the book. I think the first illustration I did were the end papers. Uh, and then I worked my way through the book uh, chapter by chapter, partly because I wanted to have uh, to, to keep the reader in mind as I created this, uh, this, you know, the images. Um, and uh, I chose, uh, as you mentioned, a, a, a very um, varied visual uh, style. I'm, I'm using my own illustrations, such as the one on the top left. I'm using found uh, materials like the postcard on the bottom left, um, and also historical photographs and objects. And I, I mean, on one page, I actually feature a piece of torn wallpaper that uh, I found in my daughter's room when we renovated our house because. Mm -hmm. It featured some cowboys on it, and I, I felt like it was. Um, it spoke to Timothy's um, section where he writes about our utopian belief in a past that was perfect, but that didn't really ever exist. We're going to um, show that in a minute. We're going to show that in a minute. <laughs> okay, and so um, it was important to me to underline the fact that um, tyranny and dictatorship and all uh, all that stuff um, is is timeless and also not unique to any particular place and that's why I mixed the styles and I brought in uh, materials from other time periods um, and on the top left uh, where Timothy writes about uh, how uh, Donald Trump though he's not mentioned by name um, was able to surmount barrier after barrier um, while you know approaching the, the, the White House, basically, it, it made me think about our passivity um, as we were watching him overcome these obstacles. And it felt to many of us, I think, like a game. It looked childish and ridiculous. Uh, and, and also we made it appear harmless and, and we became just uh, passive spectators of this terrible uh, transformation that our country was uh, was going through and that reminded me of you know of old uh, computer games uh, and that's why I why I highlighted um, Donald Trump in this way this is a, an illustration that I made by hand it's actually huge and then I scaled it down um, where I imitated this pixel style of, of early computer games uh, my daughter actually helped me fill in these little um, checks which which helped um, and then on the bottom, uh, Timothy writes about um, 
uh, the importance of looking abroad and that sometimes people who watch us from abroad can recognize patterns and potential dangers before we do. And this is a postcard um, featuring people looking at uh, the eruption of a volcano from afar. And then on the right hand side, there's an old uh, Russian postcard that shows a idealized landscape. Um, and uh, I forgot what the what the subtitle says, um, there is a, uh, sorry, what's the page number again on this? Okay, like we're on page 80, 89, and it looks like a, a very kind of a, a, a romantic, uh, romantic right. rural setting. And the, the subtitle underneath the photograph is, uh, the, the postcard is a grand road in fall. So I wanted to capture this kind of propagandistic and idealized uh, idea of one's one's home because this paragraph talks about propaganda and, and disinformation. And then I combined this uh, postcard with a drawing of the Twitter bird, but with camouflage patterns. Uh, and, th and this brings us back to what Timothy with Tim was saying before um, about you know the fact that it, all, all of these dynamics, these tyranny dynamics are not something that take place in places like Washington and Berlin or, 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 or Moscow. They take place in everyday life and it's our responsibility, it's our engagement where we're connected to those those things that are happening far away. So the way the way that you illustrate that and you bring it down to sometimes very uh, very ordinary seeming scenes, I think, is one of the crucial contributions of the illustrations. Let me ask you about one of the motifs, um, the, the the mask motif. Um, if uh, Kendra, if you could move to the um, one of the slides with the masks, um, you have a lot of illustrations of faces. And if you could turn the next one also, the next slide. This is one of my favorites because um, uh, these these dolls are a toy that I remember having when I was, I, somehow I got my hands on one of these where you would put uh, different dresses or different uniforms on different figures. And of course the middle illustration where you're really capturing the degree to which different people could be combined with different roles in society. And then the really chilling and disturbing one, this on the uh, on on the next page. Would you talk about why faces are such a big theme in your work? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, this book is about human behavior, and it's a call to action. And I wanted that to be reflected in the images as well. I wanted to make the image the, the the faces look at the viewer uh, and have them. Uh, I wanted to underline this idea of witnessing, which I think in my mind is uh, to a large degree what illustrators do in a way. By creating images, we provide insight and we become witnesses and we allow, allow other people to become witnesses of certain political processes and ideas. And um, I wanted I wanted these faces to look at the viewer um, as if to say, you know, what, what are you doing to... Um, to recognize these patterns that we have to recognize and what are you doing to try to uh, defend your democracy on a day-to-day -day level um, and that was that was the idea the idea of witnessing the idea of also empathy I think illustration is also a lot about empathy drawing in the viewer um, so so that was that was the, the main reason for why I chose this um, we could, if we could turn to chapter six um, to show our, our, our viewers one more. That's on uh, page 35. Um, one more. Nope, oh, that was one back. There we go. I, I, I think this is one of the most uh, disturbing sequences in the book. Um, am I reading it correctly that it's the transformation of a soldier into a murderer, into a skull? I like it that you call my work disturbing. It actually makes me happy because it means that it, you know, hopefully, you know, the goal is to make to make people think uh, or to startle them in some ways. Um, yeah, so this was uh, one of the few uh, chapters where I actually used the same motif throughout an entire chapter. And I created uh, a paper head uh, that is, I mean, it could be that one of a soldier, it, it could be that of a paramilitary, you know, self-proclaimed um, uh, defender of freedom. Um, um, 
So I'm, I'm not specifically saying this is a soldier. Um, it could be, could be anybody, um, you know, with a weapon uh, trying to defend whatever their self-proclaimed uh, value is. And then um, over the course of these pages, um, I created a kind of a guide, an origami, simple origami guide that shows what you could do to this paper face uh, in order to transform this character step by step. Because a lot of what Timothy writes about is this um, slow transformation that we often aren't even, even aware of, these little steps uh, in which uh, democracies can turn into dictatorships. And uh, so I wanted to show this slow progression that leads event eventually towards this face of, of tyranny. I mean, and that's the character on the very right that we then chose for the cover of the book, because to me, it does re represent um, tyranny itself, the face of tyranny. Um, so that was the idea behind this. And another reason for why I use this kind of collage and three-dimensional approach in the book uh, is because it was important for me to show the traces of my work. I wanted to say, by doing that, I wanted to say that, uh, again, every illustration is created in co context of something else, but that's also symbolic for every action, everything we do as people um, also relates to what happened before. You know, our thinking is completely shaped by what happened before, by the histories of our countries, and we exist in relationship to it. And so I wanted to capture these traces and I also wanted to bring in uh, an interactive element that um, symbolizes our engagement in this both positive and negative processes. I wanted to invite the reader to reflect on how they themselves by being actively or sometimes also passively involved because passivity obviously is also a political act um, in, in these processes um, and to be aware of them and to, um, to try to um, yeah, be more conscientious of of what they do and how they do it. Um, I think we should get to some questions from our audience, yes? Um, so our first question comes from Clayton Vreeland in Los Angeles. Um, Clayton writes, um, regarding the discussion about objective truth, if the big lie leads to conspiracy theories and conspiracy theories lead to violence, what is the best way to deny the big lie without inviting violence? So this is actually a question that I think about a lot because so much of so much of anticipatory violence, anticipatory uh, obedience, is um, in rea perceived reaction to slights that are based on lies. So how do you challenge the lie without getting the violent reaction to it? So I I appreciate this question partly because it affirms something that I was trying to say in the book, which is. The political significance of truth, political significance of truth and lies, uh, which is not a big theme. You know, the I, I was it was me who introduced the term "big lie" into the American political debate last November and December in reference to Mr. Trump's claim that he won, and I could do that because I'd been thinking about these themes the entire time and, and trying to argue that what people say what people say matters not just in terms of its spin but in terms of its relationship to some kind of an objective world. And that's why November and December of last year were so disturbing because Mr. Trump knew what he was doing. Like he knew that this wasn't just a falsehood. He knew that it was gonna reshape the Republican party. He knew that it was going to become a filter for what right-wing media could do. Um, he, he, he knew, I, mean, I don't know if he knew this, this is probably giving him too much credit, but it then was also the case that the big lie becomes the overarching justification for a whole series of state level legal moves which, uh, which make it quite, which make it more likely that we're going to have a fake election in 2024 than than we had in 2020 or in 2016. By fake election, I mean an election which is accompanied by a president becoming president, a candidate becoming president after having lost the election, which I think is now more likely than not, in fact, in in the U.S. in 2024. So, I think you know the, the, it's it's a wonderful question because you 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 can't do it on your own right there's no point like mounting your horse and you know getting you know putting on your your your, your 10 gallon hat and riding off like you know in it, to, to try to try to take down the big lie by yourself you have to first um you have to first claim this virtue that we've talked about of factuality that's the first thing you have to do say there is the truth is real second you have to constantly reinforce the importance of individual experience so we all cast votes right you cast a vote i cast a vote did you actually you yourself see anything 
right? Which involves the third thing, which is making a, making a distinction between the virtual world and the real world. So if I'm talking to somebody about this stuff, I try very hard to look them in the eye, to try not to let them use their phone to look something up, you know, to say, okay, you talk to me personally, like don't use the internet, don't refer to the internet, don't talk about stuff you read on the internet. You talk to me about stuff you saw, right? Let's talk about this as people because we're the ones who cast votes. And that's true for the big lie and, and, for, and for other stuff. And then the other thing is, um, you always want to say the things that you believe and you want to say them in a calm in a calm voice and, and making eye contact but you don't want to ever you don't want to think you're going to win the argument because that's not really the stake the stake is not winning the argument the stake is if if they walk away thinking that you're a person then you won because what the big lie is ultimately about is not the truth of the matter it's ultimately about dehumanization it's ultimately about saying the people who don't accept my big lie are not human, not Americans, not human, not part of our polity, right? And therefore, it's okay in 2024 if we don't count their votes. It's okay in 2024 if they if they lose, even if they win. It's okay to do stuff to them because they're not real. They're not really Americans, not really people. So if you can end the conversation having planted a few seeds and with the other person regarding you maybe as a human being, that's success. And if you ain't, if you expect more than that, then you're going to be constantly disappointed. Oh, and support journalists. Pay for subscriptions. Help the people who are actually investigating this stuff against the drumbeat of, of the right-wing press, which is just repeating stuff. So uh, I, I want to follow up with a question from Pamela Benjamin, because it's an on exact, a very closely related topic from Livingston, Montana. She thanks you for creating this wonderful book. She says she feels like she's been chicken little for years uh, and that her fears are now being validated by you. Um, she's a librarian and in the defense of de democracy in her words. And she asks you whether the public is aware of it or not that, that that defense of democracy is part of their professional ethics. She says she's been apoplectic about the American Library Association's lack of leadership in misinformation. What role or responsibility do you think libraries, public or academic, have in this fight to defend democracy? Uh, I mean, I, I can't, like, this is like, this is like one of the many ways in which I want to think of myself as a conservative. Like, I feel there's a vacuum in like that area of conservatism that like can be filled. Because I think the idea that we should read books is like a very traditional idea, right? But the, but the, but the wonderful thing about books is that they are unpredictable. So, you know, the, the, the goddamn internet is predictable, right? Like not only is it predictable. It predicts it, what you want. And yeah, you. it predicts you and it makes you more predictable as you get used to the channels down which it is drawing. Whereas a library shelf, not just in its individual volumes, but in this arrangement, it contains more unpredictability than the entire internet. Right. And so just getting people to take their physical bodies to the local library, you know, which wonderful people um, like Pamela are, are keeping going is, is doing something tremendous for democracy because democracy only works if I have a perspective where I can say whatever your idea is, like I've got my way into it, like the big lie, for example, but you can only have your way into it. If you're reading novels, you know, if you're reading history, if you've got your own language, right? Like that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the lessons of the book was be kind to language. And that's the one about reading books. And so in that way, like public libraries, like, you know, like investigative journalism, like anything which enriches our vocabulary and makes our minds a little bit more nimble and more unpredictable is a defense of democracy. Because so long as it's like your story and my story and you think there's only one story, as long as it's like that, we're, we're done, right? Authoritarian both, both, is about narrative, right? Democracy is about unpredictable individuals. And both, and both as an illustrator and as and, and as the original author, um, you know, this this focus on human beings, on the people, on the bodies of the human beings, but also on those social relationships. You know, when we go to a library, we meet other human beings, we interact with them, we have a public. The public on social media is very, is extremely mediated and it's very um, it's very challenging. Um, Eleanor Conrad, and she doesn't tell us where she's from, she asks uh, two interesting questions. Nora, uh, what made you choose the photo of the anonymous man in the first picture on page one? And Timothy, she asks a follow-up question. Did you mean to be so ominous ending the quote, the book quoting Hamlet? Because Hamlet doesn't survive his own story. Um, so I, uh, I think, She's oh, referring... sorry. She's from Madison. She's from Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, no. That's referring the to this to this photograph. Yeah. Um, and um, 
well, throughout the last eight years or so, I've been uh, collecting uh, photographs and objects, personal photographs and objects at flea markets, mostly in Germany, but also in other countries. Um, from the time of the Third Reich, because uh, I'm German and um, my grandparents died before I could ever ask them about the Nazi regime and the Holocaust, because I was still very young when they when they died, and they were never able to provi provide me with a with a physical sense of what it meant uh, growing up, uh, living through that regime, and um, so in an attempt to get a more direct entry point or visceral understanding of that time and how. Germans experienced it. Um, I've been going to these flea markets and collecting all kinds of materials uh, and I really see flea markets and also household liquidation shops and antique shops uh, as um, depositories of, of our memories uh, and sometimes also unw unwanted memories, things that we're trying to forget. Um, and so it's, it's been a wonderful way for me to let some of these people's lives um, re-emerge by using these found photographs in my books. And um, this particular photograph is one that I found in um, West Berlin in an antique shop uh, in basically a, a, a box full of, um, full of photographs that were unlabeled but clearly from uh, the possession of a German soldier. And um, so what intrigued me about this one is that it, um, it's, it's very, I mean, I, I have no specific evidence, but it's likely that it was taken um, during the German invasion into Poland and that this man was Jewish. And the way he looks into the camera, I mean, that's, that's what I think images can do and photographs can do is uh, they can really provide you these snapshots can provide you with, with just a very uh, personal sense of history and how history was lived in a given moment and experienced by individuals. And uh, it seems as if this man was called by whoever talk, took the photograph and he turned around and looked at the camera. Uh, and so he looked at this other person that we can't see uh, decades ago, and now he's looking at us. I mean, again, it's the same motif of somebody looking at the reader. And to me, it was important to uh, to have this gaze because right at the beginning of the book, because I wanted the reader to understand that we shouldn't forget. You know, we owe it to people like him not to forget him and not to forget what happened. And um, so I, I chose to put it right across from the title page because I want. I didn't want to illustrate Tyranny, uh, I wanted to uh, illustrate the effect of tyranny. So that was one example to do that. Tim, what about, what about Hamlet? Well, and that are, actually, are we in a tragedy? <laughs> uh, no, not in the technical sense. I mean, Hamlet, the answer to Hamlet really goes, goes back to the answer to the previous question about libraries. So, and it goes back to your very first question about where this book came from. I, I wrote the lessons I started, I wrote the lessons on a, on a flight back from Europe to the US in an airplane um, a few hours after Trump had, had, had been uh, announced the victor of the elections. And then they had a kind of life on Facebook for a while. And, um, and, and then I wanted to, and, and then people were taking them and, and then, you know, kind of cutting and pasting and using for their own purposes. And I thought, okay, now I want to have like a canonical version, you know, and and so I talked to my publisher about about putting that publishing this as a kind of online book for free, and he quite rightly said, "No, let's give it a title and let's publish it as a very simple print book, um, and you know sell it for a, a very nominal price, which is what ended up happening. And that was the right thing to do. And so I went from the so from the lessons. I, I then wrote the book, which were the historical examples. So the lessons are like you know don't obey in advance, and then a couple sentences, and then there the then, then there's the text that followed. And the text that followed, I wrote in six days at the end in December of 2016. Um, and then the publisher had it brought it out in six weeks. And on those, during those six days, uh, on my bedside table was a book by my friend and colleague, um, a Ukrainian Polish student of literature, scholar of literature called Ola Hnyatyuk, whose book in, in English is called Courage and Fear. And in her book, there's a chapter called Time is Out of Joint, which is about a Jew in German occupied Lviv in Western Ukraine, who is translating Hamlet into Ukrainian. Um, so this, this, so, so that, like that image was in my mind and it had returned me to Hamlet, which is a book 
one of the few books that I read every few years. And every time I read Hamlet, I get something else out of it. So it happened to be the case that I was reading this book with the reference to Hamlet and then Hamlet itself in December of 2016 when I put the book together. So I don't want to I don't want to overinterpret why Hamlet is there. I, 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 time is out of joint is very important because I end the book by talking about something I call the politics of inevitability and the politics of eternity and these false ways of understanding time, which lead us away from the future. And what I'm trying to suggest at the very end, actually, when I, you know, as 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 uh, as as the the questioner quite rightly says, I'm not talking about the whole of Hamlet. I'm talking about the moment where Hamlet says, "I don't have any choice except to do something about this," you know, uh, but let's do it together. That's, that's the moment that I'm trying to catch, right? Things didn't work out for Hamlet. They may not work out for us, but that spirit that Hamlet has of seeing things the way they are, feeling that maybe it's too much responsibility, and then saying, no, I'm going to try this with my friends. That's the spirit that I was after. That's what I was trying for at the end. And Nora's illustration or Nora's choice of a postcard at the end captures that really beautifully. Um, um, Kendra, if you could go to the, uh, sl the slide last slide on the PowerPoint. Um, so, so, you know, I'm, I, I read, I read both of your books um, excitedly and very, really enjoying both of them, enjoying them uh, as text and as image. Um, but I'm an educated white man and uh, I have a well-paying job and, and I have a steady employment and I have the privilege of feeling like democracy kind of works for me. Um, but they're, that's not, all of your readers may not feel that way. There's been a large movement in, certainly in the last few years in the United States, but around the world, and of course, the long tradition of people feeling like democracy is good for some people, but not for others. For them, they might read your book and they might say, um, this is not a decline out of, this is not a, a decline into tyranny. This is, we're still trying to get out of tyranny. And Nora, you kind of picked up that theme, I think, very nicely in your illustration uh, by specifically referencing African Americans, Native Americans, and the images of America as this. And that you're, there's the the image you were talking about. It looks like it was from your daughter's wallpaper. Is that correct? Is that the one? Did I get yeah. it right? So, so what would you what would both of you say to people who have been struggling to be included in democracy and civil society at all in places like the United States? or in other countries for, for whom the claim of democracy has never been real. Yeah, I think, I think, that's, I think that's right. I mean, it, 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 the, so, the, so On Tyranny was written from a defensive position. Like On Tyranny was about trying to, it was actually you know, largely about trying to get people whose antenna may not have been out right. to realize that there was a problem. Right. Um, I mean, if you think back to 2016, reaffirming your point, who was it in 2016 who was saying that Trump might be elected? It was people in my in my little world. It was Russians and Ukrainians, so people who had you know had a slightly broader view of what was possible in politics, right. and it was African Americans, right? In my world, like in my milieu, those were the two groups who said this is going to happen, and it's like it's not this is going to happen, and it's much more in the mainstream. In different ways like the, but this is much less surprising than you think and it's going to happen and that or it could happen right it's not surprising if it if it if it does happen it's not a shock and one of the things i was trying to do in on tyranny was work against the shock of people like of the people who think democracy works for them right. because if you're already on the margins you're not going to be shocked right you may you're going to think this is maybe more of the same but worse i was trying to work with i was trying to work against the idea of shock i was trying to say look your shock is going to be your excuse not to do anything. And so let's try to get over the shock and let's begin, you know, with this simple progression of things that you can start doing, which will actually make a difference. And that will make you, that will make you feel better, right? Because you'll actually be doing something. And by the way, it'll make it more likely that democracy proceeds. That's what I was up to in On Tyranny. At the same time, I mean, I was writing this book called Road to Unfreedom, which is my analysis of why things went wrong. And in that book, questions of, of race play a much bigger role. Right? Because my analysis of where things have gone wrong is quite consonant with what you were saying, namely that we, 
American democracy is a future project, right? I mean, we've been we've been a better democracy since 1965, but in the last 15 years, we've been clearly backsliding on pretty much whatever dimension you choose to focus on. And so if we wanna have a democracy, we can't just play defense, right? We also have to have some kind of a vision of, of what things would be like. And so for people who think that democracy is not working for them, I agree, like that's probably right, you know, but, but the question then is, do we affirm democracy and press forward, or do we give up on the idea, right? And I guess my, my school of thought would be the, a, a less imperfect democracy is better than a more imperfect democracy. And it's very important, you know, not to, not to fall for the siren song, which says, yeah, you know, like it's a joke everywhere, right? Because yeah. may, there may be some jokey elements to it everywhere, right? And, and, and there may be some serious flaws to it everywhere, like our long history of voter suppression or our, you know, or the disenfranchisement of, of, of formerly incarcerated people. There are some big, big, you know, racial problems at the center of the American history of democracy, but there are worse examples of democracy as there are better ones. And so my view is that democracy would be a really good thing. Like, you know, Gandhi's view of Western civilization, like it would be, it would be a really good thing. And that's, you know, going back to the beginning of our conversation, that's why the book kind of aims in two directions. If you think there's a crisis, these would be good things to do. If you don't think there's a crisis, these would also be good things. Also be good things to do. Yeah. Right. Nora, what what choices did you make here in representing this issue um, visually? Yeah, it's interesting because somebody asked me recently whether I chose the image on the on the left spread um, of the two African American men because it's such a a subject that's currently been discussed. And I said, you know, it's not current. I mean, it's uh, it's just <laughs> current to some of us uh, because we've never had to uh, confront the same dangers and 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 risks and, and uh, you know, challenges that, that a huge amount of people in America do. It's, uh, and, and I wanted to, um, to highlight this quote that Timothy chose by an abolitionist um, by showing a full page photograph of uh, that I found at the Library of Congress of two unidentified escaped slaves. And it was taken between 1861 and 1865 in Louisiana. And again, I wanted them to look at the camera, I mean, at the, at the reader. I mean, I looked at a lot of those photographs of escaped uh, and former slaves, uh, but this one really um, spoke to me most because um, again, they, it, they seem to ask us, you know, why can't you see that the history of slavery is uh, directly related to contemporary racism, that in a sense, slavery isn't over yet because we, um, we are still dealing with some of the same issues and we're not even seeing the connection. Um, I chose to also hand color this photograph because it's so old and the, the quality was actually quite bad and I wanted to uh, to make these men come alive again in a new way and I think the color really does that. Um, and then on the on the spread on the right, as I mentioned before, this is a piece of wallpaper that I found while we were renovating our house in Brooklyn and it must be from probably the 40s I would guess and it shows I mean, it was very hard to actually preserve a, a big piece of it because it was so crumbly uh, which was in itself a very interesting uh, thing, you know, symbolically, um, but uh, it showed an a idealized landscape um, and uh, cowboys engaging in various activities. And I juxtaposed that uh, torn wallpaper on the opposite page with a photograph that I also found in the, at the Library of Congress that was taken in 1900 uh, of the Sioux Indian uh, who was called Bad Bear. And he was a performer in uh, William Cody's Wild West show that toured the, the United States in the 1800s and at the early part of the 20th century. Um, and in this instance, I chose a photograph where the person is not looking at us because I wanted to show, um, show this character in a more reflective pose and more inward looking, uh, thinking that it would allow us to look more inward too. And um, Timothy Snyder, here talks about um, our longing for past moments that never really happened during epochs that uh, in fact were disastrous. So I tried to juxtapose this idealized, idealized notion of us as, you know, freedom fighters, as, you know, cowboys who are 
claiming their rightful territory in quotation marks with what what it was really what the situation really looked like and um, I think it's very important to look at images uh, to, to uh, from a critical point of view because again on the left hand side this is really an example for a propagandistic image and we often don't recognize images as propagandistic um, I think because images are not a reflection who we are but who we want to be and how we want to be seen and I have, I, to, I have to interrupt you. I think we've run out of time. No, I'm sorry. Um, no, 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 you're great. Oh, that was, that's a wonderful you. place to end. And on these images and this question of propaganda, I think is uh, really terrific. Um, I'll turn it over back to Rima now, I think. Maybe. Well, then, then I will thank, oops. Here I, I am. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, very much to all of you for this very inspiring and thought-provoking last hour. And a very big thank you to our speakers and all of our listeners. It was wonderful to see how many people have joined us today from so many different places. And I wanted to say, if you would like to hear Nora Krug and Timothy Snyder again, I encourage you to listen to 55 Voices for Democracy. This is a podcast by the Thomas Mann House in Los Angeles, the go to pop up Kansas City and several other partners. And modeled after Thomas Mann's BBC radio speech is appealing to listeners to resist the Nazi regime. The podcast sort of engages in very vivid uh, conversations with intellectuals, artists, and activists about how democracy can be renewed today. And Nora was our guest in April, and Timothy spoke in October. So thanks again to our guests, our moderator, Andrew Bergeson, as well as our partners at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education and the Union Station, Kansas City. And thank you so much to all of you. We hope to see you soon at the Goethe Pop of Kansas City. Uh, goodbye. Auf Wiedersehen, and a very good night to everybody.